Well, good morning. I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished guests and speakers to the second annual International Colloquium organized by the Real Colegio Complutense at Harvard University and the Institute for Ethics in Communication and Organizations. My name is Bill English. I'm a political scientist by training, and I have the very, very welcome task today of introducing and moderating our discussion. I should also note uh, at my day job, I'm a fellow with the Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching um, and with the Edmund J. Saffer Center for Ethics at Harvard University, and um, we're grateful for the Ethics Center's support for this program. I also wanted to acknowledge two other pillars of support. One really has been IECO, uh, led by uh, Dr. Manuel Guillen, who we'll hear from later, um, who's really been the visionary in organizing this. Also, the RCC has been extraordinarily helpful uh, for, in every aspect of organization. Uh, and we have today one of the representatives linking the RCC to Spain, Professor Jose Manuel Paez. So thank you for joining us, uh, as well as I'm told uh, a consul from Spain. So thank you both for being with us. Today's colloquium has been convened to examine the role of moral and spiritual motivation in building trust in organizations. Now that's a bit of a mouthful as a conference title but it suggests some specific considerations for today's agenda. In the first place, our theme today builds upon last year's colloquium, which was on the topic of building trust in organizations. Last year's discussion not only highlighted how important trust is and how difficult it can be to build, but we also reflected on what makes individuals and organizations trustworthy. That is, what makes them the kind of person or the kind of institution that people should trust. We had some very rich discussions concerning the ethics of organizations and how individuals can give voice to values. But there were lingering questions, lingering questions about the kind of motivations that people have and bring to their organizational environments. Put simply, if I can boil down last year's uh, discussion uh, in one tangent, it's hard to trust somebody who cares only about his or her bottom line. Why wouldn't someone exploit you if they were like that and they had the opportunity? And this is a serious theoretical question, in part because so many approaches to economics, politics, and management take narrow self-interest as a kind of starting point. For example, for my own discipline, I'll uh, cite a, a few things uh, we read as bread and butter issues when we teach students. Uh, the first comes from the first, I think, distinctively modern political thinker, Niccolo Machiavelli, <laughs> who concludes in his book, The Prince, quote, one can say this generally of men, that they are ungrateful, fickle, pretenders and dissemblers, evaders of danger and eager for gain. And it's for this reason that Machiavelli counsels in that chapter that it's better to be feared than loved. Adam Smith, the godfather of modern capitalism, famously noted that, quote, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher or the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own interests. And his friend David Hume remarked that, quote, every man ought to be supposed to be a knave and to have no other end in all his actions than private interest. By this interest, we must govern him. And finally, one of the great American jurists, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., taught that, quote, if you want to know the law and nothing else, you must look at it as the bad man does, who cares only for the material consequences, which such knowledge enables him to predict, not as the good man who finds his reason for conduct, whether inside or outside of the law, in the vaguer sanctions of conscience. Now, there are good reasons to assume that people are eager for gain, that the economy is driven by self-interest, and that the law will have to deal with bad men and women who care only for material consequences. And the idea is that if we build institutions capable of dealing with these aspects of human nature, we'll be better prepared for certain challenges. We'll be building on solid, although low, ground. Self-interest is something that's very concrete and it can be easily understood and strategically managed. However, this is ultimately not a fully accurate description of human nature, which even these classic thinkers readily concede. Machiavelli notes in the same chapter that friends who possess greatness and humility of spirit will be faithful. Adam Smith and David Hume both believe that moral sentiments play an essential role in a humane society, and Holmes was committed to an explicitly moral account of the law. More recently, the economist Sam Bowles has a wonderful book that's, that's forthcoming called Machiavelli's Mistake, in which he suggests that our preoccupation with self-interest and monetary incentives 
has led us to build organizations that neglect some of the better angels of our nature and may even discourage the higher motivations that people aspire to. And this can have dehumanizing effects, frustrating individuals within, within organizational environments, and it might also prevent organizations from realizing the full abilities and virtues of their members. Now, I suspect that many managers have some intuitive understanding of this reality, and perhaps it's say, fair to say that modern practice is better than modern theory. But the hope is that a better theoretical understanding of the varieties of motivation can help managers and policymakers bring out the best in people and develop organizations that deserve the trust of their employees and their customers. In summary then, we begin with the premise that people are motivated by more than immediate monetary self-interest and this banal observation has significant consequences for how we build and manage organizations. Our aim today is to consider higher sources of motivation, particularly those with moral or spiritual dimensions, in the hope that understanding these can inform better practices in business, in politics, and a variety of other organizational contexts. And leading off the discussion today is Dr. Manuel Guillen. Uh, Dr. Guillen is a professor of management at the University of Valencia. He's the founder and director of the Institute for Ethics in Communication in Organizations, IECO one of our co-sponsors, and he's the director of the IECO UNESCO Chair in Management, Governance, Trust, and Alterity. He's currently the General Secretary of the European Business Ethics Spanish Brands, Branch, IEBN, Spain. Widely published, Dr. Guillen is the author of the book Ethics in Organizations, Building Trust, published by Pearson Prentice Hall. So Dr. Guillen, to get us started, um, I want to know if it's possible for, for us to articulate a fuller or more complete description of human motivations, one that brings out sort of the full dimension of human experience, um, and also the, what, the what way in which that incorporates moral and spiritual dimensions of human experience. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Bill, for being here, for coming, for organizing this moderating colloquium, and thank you to the panelists for accepting the invitation, and thank you everyone in the room for being here. It's really like a dream. It's the second year, I, I can't believe this. But <laughs> I have just 10 minutes to, well, I want to also to say thank you to Jose Manuel Paez. Mm -hmm. He probably will say something later, a few <coughs> words, representing the Real Colegio, and of course the Consul of Spain. But everybody, also the camera guys and those guys recording now, thank you very much for coming. Uh, in 10 minutes, I had to tell you something that took me more than 20 years to learn. In 10 years, in 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll probably could be running just telling this, but I guess that is a graphic thing. That's why I wanted to have a PowerPoint there. It would be very graphic and, I guess, simple, because I've been discussing this with my students. If not, we may discuss later. But in 10 minutes, I guess, I can get through the entire idea. Mm -hmm. This is about the story of a professor teaching and being wrong for 20 years when teaching motivations. So I was teaching to my students about motivation, and always you start from Abraham Maslow theory which is the well-known pyramid of motivations. And I, th I thought, okay, I have to explain this, but every time I'm explaining Maslow, I feel like I'm missing a lot of things. So I was trying to put into dialogue Abraham Maslow's theory, the pyramids, with other guys, like other people, like Herbert, talking about extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Everybody knows that. But let me just try to present all those taxonomies of their, or description of human motivation in just a simple table where you find first the group of extrinsic motivations, which means we are here, for example, or we are teaching, or we are running a business for reasons that have to do with what you and me, we receive from outside, extrinsic. And that could be in a lower level, which means we receive <coughs> useful good for yourself, which could, call, could be called support, reward, whatever you want. But you receive something from outside that is material. And then you have an upper level going to Maslow area, which is related with the psychological aspects, and is I am receiving a pleasant, a pleasant good for myself from outside, extrinsic, right? Um, then, then you move to the area of Herbert that the extrinsic goods or the extrinsic motivations, you know, where they are not present, like imagine we don't have air conditioning here. I mean, we, were, we would really be not motivated at all. But he's saying that by having the extrinsic things, you don't get motivated. You need the intrinsic. You don't 
have enough with extrinsic. So the intrinsic comes from inside, which means while you're doing the action, you're acquiring something. So in the lower level means you are acquiring a useful or practical good, which is like mastery. You're good at something, you're learning. While doing the action, you're learning intrinsic. Or while doing the action, you are enjoying getting some satisfaction. So then, there you get lower level, upper level of Maslow idea and extrinsic and intrinsic. I put in that sense to my students and everybody could remember and understand in a simple way. And by the way, all the theories, taxonomies of the 60s, 70s, and 80s can be put in that table. All of them, all the taxonomies. Which brings us to the second step in which I was wrong. Because I was telling to my student, why do we have lower and upper level, lower useful goods? Meaning, as Aristotle used to say, those goods that you're looking for the sake of something else, not for their own sake. Useful, practical material for something. And then pleasant goods, you look them for their own sake. They're nice. So we get an explanation that is fine, but I and keep telling to my students for years and years, you know what, we are missing something. We're not talking at all about some of the important things that are also goods and we care about. And for example, where is morality here? No moral dimension here. So I told them, okay, let's try to change this together. So for years we were working together during the class and said, okay, let's go back to Aristotle. And Aristotle is talking about three kinds of human goods. Useful good, pleasant good, but also moral good. So it seems that not everything is loved, but only what is lovable, and that this is either what is good or pleasant or useful. Morally good or pleasant or useful, or he's calling that honest good, pleasant good, and useful good. So let's move here, adding a new dimension where you get, okay, you want to receive from people, from the external aspect, extrinsic, you want to receive moral good, which means you want people to tell you the truth. You want people to deal with you in a fair way, to give you justice. So those are moral goods, and those are human motivations. And this is what Donna is going to talk about, which is about dignity. We are supposed to receive moral goods because we are human beings. So we demand them. It's a basic thing. So we were missing that in, in my classes. I was missing this for years and years. Then I told to my students, come on, students, we should talk about respect as a motivation we are expecting to receive. And then if we go to the moral level but intrinsic, you will have this action that you're doing. While you're doing the action, you're learning, getting useful good. You're enjoying getting pleasant good but also getting moral good, which is called virtue. You acquire virtues while you are working in your job. It's not something separate from your family life or your job. It's while you're a good professional guy, a good professional person, means you're acquiring virtues like order, uh, whatever, all the virtues, joyfulness, cheerfulness, optimism, those are human virtues. Moral aspects of your character that you acquire through habit while you are doing the action. So those are motivation. You want to do the right thing. You want to be good. Fine. So in previous theories we were discussing in class, there was an assumption, which is those theories are amoral. Let's not talk about morality at all. So not talk about morality means go just back to the two levels. But if you go back and say, OK, we are moral, moral people. We need those levels. But here there is another assumption also, which is, we are self-interested. Because if you look at the definitions, the first one is about receiving something. It's like the arrow coming to you. I want to receive things for me. And the second line, the second column, is about acquiring something for me. So everything here is assuming that we are self-interested, and that's all. So we are missing, again, something really important, which is the area of giving. So we, if we are missing that, we have to introduce that as part of the theory. Then. We call that transitive motives or transactional or transcendental or transcendent motives, which means you are giving the useful good to other people, serving people. You are giving the pleasant good to other people, trying to be nice with other people, caring for them in terms of feelings. And you're trying to help them in the moral sense, which is the classic word called benevolence in Latin, benevolence, giving the good to other people. So you get the entire picture of Maslow theory, but with the moral aspect and the giving aspect. So Sandra, we will talk about the wisdom and moral aspect, and Tomas, we will talk about the giving aspect. We will go deeply there. 
And I, you could say, I could say, well, good, we have a new theory. We are discussing and in, a, in dialogue with Maslow, done. Morality is here. I was giving this presentation two years ago or three years ago here in this same room to a group of scholars and a, a student from MBA program at Harvard. He came to me at the end of the presentation and said, you know what, I love this, but, but what? <laughs> but where is the spiritual motivation here? Where is the spiritual thing? And I told him, you know what, you're right. I mean, I tried to, to live this in my personal life. Uh, it, could be, it could be schizophrenic not to tell to my student that I'm trying to live in a spiritual way in my life and then explaining a universal new theory of motivations. So I told him, you know what, this is, okay, it's fine, but I'm missing something. So the story is that after that moment, and for a year, I met, well, I, I already knew Michael Holman. We decided to write a paper together adding the spiritual dimension. So this is the paper that has just been published in the Journal of Venice Ethics last month with Michael Holman, he's here, thank you, Mike, for everything, and uh, also with a professor from Spain. So we are including also the spiritual dimension. How? Simple, is there. Look at that. Spiritual goods. So first you start by receiving goods that are spiritual, which means in that spiritual level is related with everything that you cannot not explain, that has to do with the mystery, is spiritual, is holy, it's not just good, it's something more. For those who believe in God or have a religion, that could be the Holy Spirit giving you gifts. Or for those believing in any spiritual aspect of human life, like life itself, this is a spiritual gift. So this is opening the door to all those people believing in something that is spiritual, not just moral, and is there. Um, if you're open to that, means, okay, if you believe in eternal life or heaven, that's a reward coming from outside, from something spiritual, it's there. And some people is working not only for the material aspects or the moral aspect, but also for the final reward. It's there, now it's there, before it was not. And then you have in the upper level of the moral intrinsic motive, you have the virtue, but not the virtue in itself, but the holiness, which is becoming holy, which is adding the spiritual dimension to the just moral virtue, but based on moral thing. And when you give your spiritual thing to others, Usually we call that self-giving. In a Christian tradition, that could be apostolate. We are talking to people to what you believe, but it's self-giving, giving yourself in a spiritual way. Well, the last point I have to say, I don't know, probably how, I, is this like eight, 10 minutes? I was teaching Abraham Maslow, right? Abraham Maslow, one of the latest books by Abraham Maslow. I didn't know this book. I've been teaching Maslow for years and years, and I didn't read this final book or one of the latest books. And amazing, it's called The Father Reaches Human Nature. And here he's saying, he's saying, I was basically I was wrong, my pyramid should be uh, updated, <laughs> and you should talk about transcendent giving. In the sense that self-giving is the highest and most noble <coughs> human motivation, he was saying, he's saying here. In fact, he's talking about the transcenders and describing like 35 definition of transcendence, of giving, but when describing to Sanders, he's just saying, because it will be so difficult for so many to believe, Abraham Maslow. I must state explicitly that I have found approximately as many transcenders among businessmen, industrials, managers, educators, political people, as I have among the professionally religious poets, intellectuals, musicians, and others who are support, supposed to be transcenders and are officially labeled, labeled on with that level. I mean, he's talking about this, and then he's saying in his book that, by the way, religion is, has to do with meta-motivations, and spirituality with meta-motivations, which are on, on the upper level. So it's exactly the same idea, said by Abraham Maslow later. So I'm telling not to my students, you have to read this book, because he's talking about this, <laughs> and nobody knows, and nobody's talking about that. <laughs> by the way, you believe in just spirituality, you're on top of that level. But if you really believe in one God, then he should be part of this. It's one, if you believe in one God as a person, then should be part of the relationship. You have the different levels of objects and the subjects. So if you open the door to the other with capital, then you get the religious motives. Religare from Latin, religious, means there is another one, a God. So if you open the door to that possibility, and there are millions of human beings who believe in God, 
you have to open that possibility to explain this. <laughs> then you will have that in your work daily, you may be doing things out of all these motivations, but also to serve God, out of serving God, giving back useful God to him, to God, it's serving him, doing his will. You may also want to give him gratitude, saying thank you for whatever you receive, for everything you receive. So it's like you are opening the door to another spectator in your work, being watched by the other with capital. So you are giving thanks, and when you are the moral thing, when you, are, you've, you know that you are in front of God, uh, then you say, okay, the moral thing is to worship, give back honor, adoration. So in your work, as part of your work, you may have all this motivation, including the possibility of offering your work to God while you're working. And you don't need to, be, to do anything external, extraordinary. It's just by saying, okay, thank you for giving me my job, my family, everything, and it's back to you. Thank you for that. So the highest noble human motivation is not self-giving to others. It's self-giving to the other, which is giving him glory, glorifying him, the glory of God. So now I guess that now you get the entire description of human motivation, of entire human flourishing. Should we talk about this to the business people? I guess we should, as Bill was saying before, and I hope we will keep talking about this to our students because it's the only way of not being a schizophrenic, mm -hmm. trying to offer your work to God and then trying to do something different in your daily work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Guillen, you put a lot on the table, got us off to, I think, a very interesting and provocative start. Uh, next on our panel, we have Dr. Donna Hicks. Dr. Hicks is an associate at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs here at Harvard University. She's taught courses in conflict resolution at Harvard, Clark, and Columbia Universities, and conducted trainings and educational seminars in the U.S. and abroad on the role that dignity plays in healing and reconciling relationships in conflict. She's facilitated dialogue between communities and conflict all over the world, and has also worked as a consultant to corporations and organizations applying the dignity model. So not only widely traveled, but also widely published, Dr. Hicks is the author of the best-selling book, Dignity, and the essential roles it plays in resolving conflict, published by Yale University Press. And Dr. Hicks, um, Following on Dr. Guillen's comments, what role specifically can dignity play in creating an environment of trust and responsibility in the workplace? Yes, that's, that's a question. Thank you, Bill, um, and also Manuel. If it weren't for Manuel, this wouldn't, we wouldn't be here today. So he's being very uh, self-effacing in terms of how much of him is here with us today. So I'm most grateful, once again. And it's great to meet Sandra and to see Tomas again. And yes, so what is, um, what is the role dignity plays? Last year I talked about, I spent more time talking about the fact that I discovered the importance of this concept of dignity through all my work in international conflict. And as Bill said, I've, I've done a lot of work in international conflict. And I found that for me, which was a missing link in my understanding of conflict, and that is, what is this human dimension? You know, what happens to human beings in these conflicts that isn't about, you know, the objective political issues? Because it's those ob objective <coughs> political issues that always get put to the table. But we never talk about what does it mean to be treated as if you don't matter? What does it feel like to be treated as if you're a second class citizen, where you're marginalized, where you're so I was interested in that dimension. That was, really, that was really important to me. And then, as Bill said, I ended up spending about seven years of my life trying to write about it because there was nothing written at the time. This concept of dignity wasn't operationalized. It wasn't played out in the way that we could understand it in terms of how is this going to, what is this going to look like in my everyday life if I treat people with dignity? How is that going to improve our relationships? So those are the kind of questions that I was interested in. And I quickly, very quickly discovered that this issue of dignity wasn't just about international politics. This is about what it means to be a human being. <laughs> because every single one of us, and what I found in my research is that no matter where in the world I go to and do interviews with people about dignity, we all want the same thing. Every last one of us. It's a universal human yearning. And I think, frankly, uh, it's our highest common denominator. And I think dignity, just to, 
um, I think dignity is the, the thing that could unite us. You know, we have all kinds of differences, right? We're all from different cultures, from different this and different that. But at the end of the day, the thing that can bring us all together again, I think, I feel, is an, uh, a mutual honoring of each other's dignity. Knowing when I look at you, I know you want what I want. You want to be treated in a way that honors your identity, in a way that acknowledges who you are, in a way that recognizes your unique qualities in a way of life, in a way where you're treated fairly, in a way where you're included in things. Anyway, there, these are just a few of the ways we can be, have our dignity honored. But So as I said, it quickly came to me that this isn't just about international politics. I was invited to, to work in the corporate world. And, um, and in a minute, I'm going to tell you how the, exactly the same dynamics took place in the corporate world as in international politics. I'll tell you that in a minute. But I want to first be sure that we're all on the same page about what I mean by dignity. And it's a very simple concept. Because what I realized is that dignity isn't an intellectual issue. I spent years, you know? I got PhD trying to understand this stuff. But I didn't need it. Because at the end of the day, dignity is a very simple thing. It's our, as I said, it's our yearning and our deep desire to be treated um, as if we're something of value and treated as if we're worthy. So it's our inherent worthiness, our inherent sense of value. And if you have any trouble believing this, think of, put, bring an image in your mind of a, a baby, an infant newborn baby. You look at this beautiful little thing, this creature, this precious child. Is there any doubt in your mind that that child is, has value and worth? Any doubt it whatsoever? And then you you know, you see another thing when you look at these infant babies. You see, not only are they valuable, because I, frankly, OK, I go even step further. I say they're not just valuable and worthy. I say they're invaluable. <laughs> they're priceless and irreplaceable. And at the same time, they are vulnerable. All right? You get that baby picture in your mind. They're physically vulnerable. They need us for everything, taking care of their all of their physical needs, but they also need to have their dignity taken care of. From that very young age, we all, all of us, we need it. And we are just as vulnerable to a wound to our dignity as we are to a physical wound. And there's research now out of UCLA that has, is showing that, you know, we have this wonderful brain scanning capacity now that in the functional magnetic resonance imaging um, technology, they show the, these researchers, neuroscientists, showed that a wound to our dignity shows up in the brain in exactly the same area as a physical wound. So that was all I needed. That was all I needed to take this stuff on the road and say, look, you've got to pay attention to this. This is important, this dignity stuff. You can't just say anymore, oh, it's just touchy-feely, right? Dismiss it as if it's not important. We can't do that anymore. And the evidence is there. The hard science is there that says our brain doesn't know the difference when you're injured, uh, when you're feeling humiliated versus when you're feeling like you have your arm broken or some physical injury. So anyway, I don't want to go into that too much. But here's what I want to add. Um, and I don't know we have to maybe discuss this, because I think dignity and respect are two different things. Uh, dignity is our birthright. We all deserve to be treated with dignity, each and every one of us. And even if we do bad things, you know, even if we do bad things, we have to be held accountable for our bad behavior. But at the end of the day, we're all valuable and vulnerable human beings. And we deserve to be treated as if we are something that's invaluable, priceless, and irreplaceable. Now, respect, on the other hand, I think respect needs to be earned. And when, I mean, in my business, uh, you know, we have people clamoring all the time in conflict world saying, I demand respect. Well, you can't demand respect. You have to do something in order to gain my respect. But dignity, you don't have to do a darn thing. Dignity is part of what it means to be a human being, and we all deserve to be treated that way. So, OK, so I went into the corporate world, and lo and behold, what I discovered is that there were violations of dignity every, everywhere I turned. And when I went in and I started talking to uh, people, I did several interviews before I did any, in, any kind of intervention just to get the lay of the land. What's going on here? Well, as I said, found out that people, employees, now this isn't in every organization, but in the ones that I were, actually worked in, they felt 
Um, they weren't, didn't feel cared for. They didn't feel valued. They, feel, they felt as if they were being used in order to gain whatever the, you know, the business plan was in the organization. Um, and at the end of the day, there was absolutely no trust because they didn't feel, they couldn't trust that the leadership was actually concerned about them, that they cared about the impact that their policies had. And I looked at, at, at dignity in two levels, and one at the interpersonal level, the way the leadership treated their employees, but also I looked at systemic level of indignities, which were the policies that the people created that had no consciousness about the effect that it would have on the employees. So I was working in two, two planes, one at that systemic level where I was trying to develop policy where people felt um, were mindful of the fact that their um, dignity mattered in these circumstances. So, okay, back to the people again. So what did, they, what did they feel? They felt like they were just putting in their time, right? They were getting a paycheck. They felt resentful of the way, resentment was everywhere. They felt resentful. And I said, well, why don't you speak up? You know, why don't you speak up to your boss and say, look, you know, this was really was hurtful to me when you did X, Y, or Z. And this, I remember this one woman looking at me and she said, Donna, are you nuts? You know, that would be career suicide. If I spoke up to my boss, are you kidding? I wouldn't have a job, especially in this economy. You know, this was back mm. in the past three or four years. And they said, not only am I afraid of losing my job, but I might not get that promotion. You know, they had all these reviews all the time. So, so to say the least, they, there was no trust there. And when there's no trust, you know, unfortunately what happens, people don't feel like extending themselves. People don't feel like giving of ex their uh, discretionary energy. They don't feel loyal. They feel like they got a job, they get a paycheck, that's it. They won't go that extra mile. And they're distracted. This is really fundamental. They're distracted by their own resentment, right, of not being treated well. So they can't even be creative. And so this is, you know, what I tried to do with them is to to go into and work with the leadership teams and say, look, this dignity stuff matters, right? This dignity stuff really matters. And let me just say a couple of things about what I think a, a, a dignity leader, a person who wants to lead with dignity has to know and has to embody and has to play out. First of all, they, ha they, they have to know how inherently valuable and vulnerable all human beings are. And vulnerability is the key that I think is even more important here because you know, oftentimes p leaders will do things and not know the impact that it has. By the way, by the way, let me just say this because I was telling Bill about this earlier. These are not bad leaders. These are not bad men and women who are out to get their employees. It has nothing to do with that. It is just simply they don't know. They don't understand the impact of their you know, rude behaviors on their employees. It's, they're not bad people. They're just people who are not aware of dignity and the importance of it in, in, in your relationships. So what are the 10 ways they need to know how to honor dignity? They need to know that everybody wants their identity accepted no matter who they are. They want recognition of their unique qualities and way of life. They want acknowledgement. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to be responded to. They want to belong. They, more than anything else, people who are cared for get this tremendous sense of belonging. Uh, and man, is there, are there payoffs for that one when people feel like they're part of a family where they're being taken care of? Freedom and, freedom and um, independence, people don't like to be micromanaged in the workplace. They like to be able to make the, be a part of the decisions that affect their lives. They want safety. They want to feel safe. And in what I mean by safety here, it's not so much physical safety, but they want to be safe to be able to speak out when something bad is happening in their environment. And if you don't give people that opportunity to feel secure about saying, hey, look, you know, you may not be aware of it, boss, but when you did that, it was had a terrible effect on many of the people here. We need to be able to have that conversation in the workplace. And people want to be given the uh, benefit of the doubt. They don't want to be looked at as suspicious all the time. We want to be understood. Certainly, we want to be treated fairly. And finally, we want an apology when, when the boss does something wrong or when the, when the company does something wrong that violates the employee's dignity. But they want to say, gee, you know, I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. That's what employees want to hear. 
And, and just, how am I doing there, Tomas? Yeah. How many minutes? Mm, 10 minutes. Yeah. I have 10 minutes? No, 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 I can't. I only have. Keep going. Okay, Keep going. I just want to wrap it up here by saying there are a few other things. Poor Tomas was going to tell me. Um, they, they have the, that, that, that leaders also, in addition to knowing how to honor dignity, they need to know the power they have over others. Because oftentimes leaders are not even aware of the power that they have to set the tone in their organization. And they have a wonderful sense of power. And the question is, how do you use that power to honor people's dignity, to make people feel seen, make people feel heard, right? How do we use that power to do that rather than to make them feel insignificant? And leaders need to know the effect that violations of dignity have on people. If they're not aware that treating people badly affects profits and affects not only just the climate and the environment, but it literally affects profits. And our friend here, Bill, isn't it? Yeah, he's got the data to, to back me up here, and I've got others as well, but um, other data as well. But it's, it's really clear. Bill and I had a conversation earlier. It is astonishing how much not only is this increased profits by treating people well, but how it decreases, um, what would you say, um, what's the word? It just increases the value of the culture, thanks. All right, so the, fifth, the other thing is that we have, to be, we have to know what our own vulnerabilities are as leaders, right? Because all of us has blind spots, every single one of us, we have blind spots. And usually when we violate other people, it's because we're operating from a blind spot, not because we're bad people, right? Now, this has been my big challenge here, to have people help me see my blind spots. And I think all leaders need to be able to open up to that possibility that, gee, maybe you're doing something that's having a negative effect on others. And also just knowing how powerfully people react. You know, our self-preservation instincts are so uh, deep that when somebody violates our dignity, we want revenge, right? We want to get back at that boss. We want to get even. And what happens is, if, even if you can't say it to people, to, to the boss, it goes into the underground network. <clears throat> the gossip starts, and everybody knows how bad a boss that you've got, right? All right. So finally, um, one last thing here about honoring dignity and creating a culture in the, in the, of dignity. And I, and I think we can add this somehow, Manuel, um, that I personally feel that doing this dignity work uh, in the workplace, and as you said, everywhere in your entire life, it's, it is really spiritual practice. Because you're trying to figure out, how can I bring out the best in the people with whom I uh, work? How do I bring out the best in the people in my family, in my, in my culture, in my environment? And honestly, the best way of bringing out the best in people is by honoring their dignity. And here's the bonus here. When you honor other people's dignity, you not only make them feel good, but you look good too. So you strengthen your own dignity when you when you see the other as something of value and worth, or something that's invaluable, priceless, and irreplaceable. So for me, uh, it's spiritual practice every single day. And frankly, I mess up a lot, let me tell you. It's not an easy thing to, to do this, because we're fighting our own internal uh, battles about our own worthiness. So this is, this is really a big, big challenge. I, I'm putting it out here, and it sounds like common sense. But to put it into practice, let me say it's um, takes work, but it is the most rewarding work. There's this joy on the other side of this. Once you get this and you do it as a way of life, it's a joyful life. And everybody else feels your joy, so. All right, I better stop and sound like I'm preaching here. <laughs> yes. I felt more dignified just uh, listening to your comments. Uh, and I, I, I think there's an enormous amount of wisdom there, which is fitting because our next panelist is actually speaking about uh, uh, wisdom directly. Um, Dr. Sandra Waddick is the Galligan Chair of Strategy, Carroll School Scholar of Corporate Responsibility and Professor of Management in the Carroll School of Management at Boston College. She was a co-founder of Leadership for Change, the Leadership for Change program, sustainability, responsibility, and community at Boston College, and the Initiative for Responsible Investing, which is now here at Harvard, here at Harvard uh, and, uh, and continues uh, to flourish because there continue to be uh, 
things that need to be said about responsible investing. Um, also widely published, Dr. Waddick is the author of Building the Responsible Enterprise, Where Vision and Values Add Value. And I just learned today she has a, a forthcoming book from Cambridge uh, University Press called Intellectual Shamans. And these are two words that don't often go together, and, uh, but I think they, they reflect um, a recent piece she'd published, which uh, we thought was absolutely brilliant and something worth having on the panel today. And um, she's here to talk about wisdom, so I, we can begin with the question, how does wisdom relate to intrinsic and other types of motivation that we're discussing today? Thanks, Bill, and thank you, Manuel, for inviting me. And I'm thrilled to hear about dignity. That was just wonderful. Um, so, um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about intellectual shamans, and also about people I call difference makers. Um, so, think of, for a minute about someone who inspires you, someone that you trust. <coughs> to go back to Manuel's um, framework, um, and think about for a minute what is it that inspires and what is it that you trust. And um, chances are. I'm going to argue that these individuals are going to have a multiplicity of motivational attributes along the line of the framework that we just heard about. The intrinsic, the transitive, and the spiritual, or in the sort of language that we were just talking about. In my terms, they're on a path to achieving the vision, uh, wisdom. Let me explain. I come at this notion of vision in two ways, of this wisdom in two ways. One is through some empirical work that I've done um, over the past few years, and the other is through um, some intellectual work. And so the, the article that you discovered is um, the piece of the intellectual work that I did. Um, and in that, in that piece, I define wisdom as having three core elements. Um, one of those elements is moral imagination, or what is called the good, right? Moral imagination. Um, moral imagination, uh, according to Pat Warhain, who's done a lot of work in developing this issue, and she's a business eth ethicist, um, is the ability to think through the ethical consequences of actions and decisions, to recognize where there are et ethical implications in a situation. Um, it, it reflects an orientation, in my view, towards the good. And it's an intrinsic kind of orientation towards the good. Um, in that sense, it goes well beyond the self. And people who are who have this sense of moral imagination see the good in not only in situations that they're in, they see where there are problems, ethical problems in situations. And I know Mike Hoffman has done a lot of work in helping people to um, to gain this sense of moral imagination. Um, it, it is embedded in the lives of both intellectual shamans and in the lives of difference makers. And I'll talk a little bit about them in a minute. Um, the second element of wisdom is what I call systems understanding. And here I, I go back to Peter Senge's seminal work called The Fifth Discipline, published in 1990, republished again in 2006, um, really thinking about what is it to understand the system. And, and um, Donna and I were talking a little bit before the meeting about I, I think that people need to have a certain level of cognitive capacity. Um, at, in, in Kohlberg's terms, to be at at least post-conventional, early stages of post-conventional development, so that they can be systems thinkers, to understand the systems in reasonably accurate ways, or the true, so the good and the true, right? Um, um, typically, this way is thinking beyond the self. So it definitely is has, has that transitive or trans, uh, what you call it? Transcendent. Transcendent um, um, orientation to it. And, ref and it reflects the true, and, and it's a holistic understanding of situations. It's what the managers that lack understanding of dignity that Donna was just talking about lack. They don't understand the holistic implications of what is going on in their organizations when they're making decisions and their impacts of those decisions on people. Uh, moral imagination also is um, uh, a, a capacity to see the ethical situations. So when you combine those two, you begin to get a more, a better picture of what's actually going on in your organization. The third attribute, and it's one that we don't often think about, is what I call aesthetic sensibility. Um, it's aesthetic as sensibility is the ability to appreciate the design and aesthetic elements in a situation. So many of the people that I studied really get a sense of the system and say, whoa, from a they wouldn't frame it exactly this way, but from a design point of view, there's some element missing or some problematic element in this situation. From the individual perspective, it's people aren't being treated with dignity, um, in, in, and they're 
there's so there's a flaw in the system. So we have then aesthetic sensibility or the beautiful, right? So now we have all three elements of the good, the true, and the beautiful. If we think about moral imagination, systems understanding, and aesthetic sensibility, but that's not enough. <coughs> they need to be used in the service of the greater good. So my definition of wisdom then becomes the com the integration in, in in the individual of the good, the true, and the beautiful, moral imagination, systems understanding, and aesthetic sensibility in the service of something beyond the self or the greater good. Um, so who are these people that I studied um, and, and what is this notion of intellectual shamanism? Because it really relates. The last chapter of the Intellectual Shaman's book is all about wisdom. Um, it really relates to this concept. So the difference makers were 23 individuals who started uh, this, what, uh, what I call the corporate responsibility infrastructure. So if you're familiar with all the problems of corporations, you might also be aware that there's, there are, there's a non-governmental set of efforts, lots of them in fact, to um, build uh, pressures on companies to behave in better ways. Um, so if you've heard of things like the UN Global Compact or the Global Reporting Initiative or Social Investing or any number of other initiatives, these are people who were pioneers in starting this. And they have these characteristics, although I hadn't been framing their lives in this way when I did the work. Um, there's a book out called The Difference Makers um, that really it, it looks at the, the lives of these people, the organizations they developed, and how this infrastructure developed over its early years. Um, so these difference makers who, who started out as normal human beings like you and me and were willing to take some risks and put some initiatives in place and they're not necessarily visionaries. They didn't necessarily have a grand vision when they started, but they can look back on a set of accomplishments that leads them to, um, to now claim that they would have a vision. Um, but most of them when I asked, well, what was your vision? They were like, I don't know. I, you know, I was grounded in a set of morals so they had that sort of moral imagination. I knew I wanted to make the world a little bit better, but I, I didn't quite have an idea of how to do that, so I went ahead and did these things. Um, well, intellectual shamans. So I got intrigued by the fact that there are some academics. So if you ever go to conferences, any conferences, whether you're academic or not, there's a certain set of people you, whose <coughs> sessions you're going to want. You see them on the program. Those are the sessions you want to go to. Who are they? What is it about these people that is so appealing and attractive? And I thought, well, let me look at some of these academics, my particular heroes. So my selection criteria from an academic point of view, totally non-rigorous. You know, um, but they're the people that I admire who have really changed the game in many ways. So if you're familiar with stakeholder theory, you may be familiar with Ed Freeman, who's the found father of stakeholder theory. So Ed is one of the people that I interviewed. If you know about Theory U, Otto Scharmer's work at MIT, Otto is one of the people that I interviewed. If you know about um, Henry Mintzberg and his path-breaking work on, on strategy, he's another of the people that I interviewed. So I interviewed 28 academics, all of whom had done really significant stuff that allowed them. And, and I was, I was had in, this my, in the back of my mind this paper that I had read by Peter Frost. Peter Frost was a really wonderful academic that I actually didn't know. I met him only once. Um, but he had written with Carolyn Egri a pa couple of papers on um, organization development people as shamans. Now, and I've been studying shaman for a num shamanism for a number of years with a shaman. And so I thought, well, let me go back to that paper. There was a wonderful framework in there. It became the framework for thinking about these people and the work that they do. So shamans, intellectual shamans, all shamans are healers. They are the oldest spiritual, it is the oldest spiritual tradition in the world. Um, there is no dogma associated with it. It's a healing practice, so shamans are healers, first of all. Shamans also have served two other roles, and intellectual shamans particularly serve these roles well, but all shamans serve them. They are connectors, so they, uh, I call them connectors, they, uh, uh, Egri and Frost call them um, boundary spanners or mediators of different realities because shamans, you know, traditional shamans go into, you know, um, trance states and they access information from other realms. Well, intellectual shamans are boundary spanners. They cross disciplines. They 
cross the theory practice boundary. They cross the teaching research boundary. So they're, they're integrating across boundaries. I, so I call them connectors. They connect ideas from many different realms. And the third role that they play is actually that uh, in, in the Frost paper, they talk about it as uh, spiritual uh, leadership. Um, but it's a sense-making role. Carl White talks about this as a, who's one of the people I interviewed, talks about this as a, uh, as a sense-making as sense making. So one of the problems that that uh, in traditional cultures, shamans see that a patient is sick, comes to them, and they what they believe is that there's something wrong with the cultural surround, the, or the mythologies that the patient believes, and that's what's causing the illness. And so they access these other realms, they, they connect um, to the universe, my, my shaman would say, my teacher, um, and they bring information back to help heal that cultural mythology and to change the, the situation for the patient. Well, think of what intellectual shamans are doing is there's a broken myth. You know, Maybe it's a set of practices and businesses that are broken. So you go in and you discover that dignity is not being accorded to people. And we know that that's such a foundational element of morality, that people should be treated well with respect. If they're not being treated with respect, there's no dignity there. Um, you know, So they go out and they find that. And, and so we know Donna has at least one of the characteristics of the intellectual shaman, because she's got this healing orientation. She wants to heal organization. And she's connecting ideas that people haven't connected in that way, quite that way before. And then she's going out and making sense of it to people. So that's what the intellectual shaman um, does. Um, these people come to their work with a clear sense of purpose or Thank values. You. Thank you. Oh, you know, we could also look at Manuel and the framework he just put together as having a sim similar kind of orientation. But you know, um, just go for everybody. everybody. <laughs> no, but the, my belief is we all that the world is in huge trouble today, right? If we think about climate change, if we think about um, many practices in academia, if we think about many practices in business, uh, if we think about many practices in government, we think about all the conflict in the world that, that you're so familiar with, um, then we need many, 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 many more people to become shamans or intellectual shamans if we happen to be academics. Um, they come to their work with a clear sense of purpose and that, we could call that a spiritual motivation. It's almost like a calling for people. And in doing their work, they have to become fully who they are. In other words, if we're academics today, we're under, in, at least in management schools, under this sort of pressure to produce a lot of A journal articles in my field, uh, hits, A hits, and to get our impact factor up there, our citation counts. They don't have that orientation. They have a better sense of purpose. It's about an idea and following the idea and thinking about that idea and making sure that that idea really works in the world. So it's different. It's a different sense of purpose. They have to become, I call it, fully who they are. And in doing that, they serve their purpose and they're, and they're called to that purpose. And, but that makes them a little strange Sometimes they are stepping outside of the normal academic boundaries in the case of intellectual shamans, or they're stepping outside the normal boundaries um, in organizations. Um, my colleague Judy Neal, um, who, who founded an organization called Spirit at Work, which relates to your framework as well, um, talks about these people who walk the boundaries in organizations um, between at the interstitious between different functions and trying to make the place better, trying to make the organization better or its relationship with stakeholders better, edge walkers. So these difference makers, edge walkers, and shamans are the people who do the healing work that gets us to all, all of uh, the, the levels of motivation that your framework talks about and who also come to wisdom, um, I think, in the end, through their work and through reflecting on their work over, over time. So I guess the funda fundamentally I want to leave you with, I think we all have the capacity to do this shamanic type of work to come to this form of wisdom if we're willing to take the risk to do so. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Waddick. That's a very rich set of reflections and that brings us full circle. We've discussed dignity, we've discussed wisdom, but one thing on Dr. Gian's side which uh, hasn't been 
as explicitly addressed yet is this phenomenon that was up there of, of giving, of disinterested giving, of generosity, uh, of giving of oneself. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Tomas Baviera, is the Assistant Director of the Institute for Ethics and Communications and Organization. And he's the director also of the Oblet University Residence in Valencia. He has a Bachelor of Science in Telecommunications Engineering from the Polytechnic, Polytechnic University of Valencia, a Master's Degree in Communication and New Technologies from the CASO Foundation, and he holds a PhD in Communication Sciences from the University of Valencia. Dr. Vera, I also have to point out, recently published a, uh, a fantastic little book called Thinking with Chesterton on the work of G.K. Chesterton, uh, who's a very popular, popular author in the English-speaking world, uh, introducing them to Spanish audiences. Um, but today, uh, I hope that you could maybe address this, this aspect of Manuel's slide uh, that hasn't been discussed, this phenomenon of disinterested giving. Uh, are there logics or rationales that help us understand what that is? Uh, and how we might promote it in organizational contexts. Thank you very much for your kind presentation. And also, I would like to thank the Real Colegio for all this activity and to the Harvard Center for Ethics and Bell University for supporting this seminar. Um, a similar question was posed to me by a sophomore last year while I was at Bell University in a postdoctoral research. I remember it pretty well as she made me think a lot about the convenience of uh, provide a reasonable answer. We were waiting for the bus, so it was not difficult to start a conversation. As you guess, my condition of a stranger focused the dialogue. At what point, she asked me, what are you researching? This question was unavoidable. <laughs> and the answer, easy, uh, I told her I was uh, studying the logic of giving. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, what is the logic of giving? <laughs> Briefly, I explained to her that it was uh, to give to someone uh, without expecting a return. She looked at me very curiously. She kept silent, smiled, and she asked me, do you really believe that it was possible? <laughs> so it seemed to me that this student was relegating the behavior of giving to the realm of fantasy, as if as it was not reasonable. But far from disappointing me, uh, this conversation stimulated much more my curiosity to delineate this logic. The problem is not solely misunderstanding gift giving. It is true that this could be interpreted as imposing uh, an implicit debt to be demanded in a future. However, our experience confirms a genuine gift is never a transaction. In my opinion, the real problem is that if we miss a proper interpretation of such giving, we will miss other human realities which follow the same logic. This is the case, for instance, of trust building. If we want to build trust as if we were buying it, we could get a broad range of responses. But it would be very difficult, in fact impossible, to get a relationship based on genuine trust. One of the ideas we owe to Aristotle is the clarification of a good life. He states that Without friends, no one would choose to live, though he had all other goods. I am pretty sure we will agree with Aristotle if we have experienced the loss of a very close friend. He or she is irreplaceable. Artists reflect this void very accurately. This is the case of Spanish poet Miguel Hernández, who wrote an elegy after his friend Ramon Sijes' death. The poem is open with three lines. In Orihuela, his town and mine, death has taken from me, as if struck by lightning Ramon Sijes, with whom I loved so much. Hernández was a goat shepherd and became a great poet with the help of Sijes. They both shared a passion for poetry and Hernández was well aware 
how his friend has helped him to flourish his literary talent. The last line, with whom I loved so much, reflects the core of friendship, to share lovable goods. This is the same idea Aristotle points out as the authentic friendship. He distinguishes things that are desired because they are useful for obtaining other goods, and things that are desired because they are good in themselves. The first kind of goods builds friendship in so far as we need those friends. The latter builds genuine friendship. In the case of useful goods, we can assign them a price. They have an exchange value. But if we try to get any kind of goods as if we were buying and selling, even those which Aristotle identifies as good in themselves, then we face a real danger. Michael Sandel has recently pointed out that this process ends in a corruption of those valuable goods. Even more, this market process does affect us also. Oscar Wilde wrote that the cynic is a man who knows the price of everything at the value of nothing. There are goods with, which are valuable in themselves. They cannot be bought as in a shop because they have no price. They are priceless. In fact, this kind of goods has to be always received unconditionally. Thus, giving them to our friend or to anyone reflects our benevolence. We want the good of the other. Grasping the reality of benevolence helps us to transcend the instrumental reason. However, up to, this, up to this point, we are trapped between the instrumental reason and the moral reason. Is this interest in giving an appearance for a posterior transaction? Or does it respond to a duty which compels us to give? Or is it anything more? I think this problem reflects what Chesterton most missed in the public debate. He held, we are fond of talking about many social and moral issues as a dodge to avoid discussing what is good. This is a decisive point for benevolence. Without a sense of the good, it is impossible to develop a, a congruent giving. We will confuse it with self-interest or with righteousness. The discussion about the good is a very broad topic in which I will just provide and track a fruitful clue. It is provided by one of Dostoevsky's character who holds that beauty will save the world. Experience of beauty can happen walking in a garden, contemplating a nightfall, or listening Mozart. When it happens, we are shaken by a joyful resonance. This particular joy does not come from satisfied interests or biological needs. Beauty is always received. It can be neither predicted nor claimed. It is a gift, a joyful gift. This joy opens a path to understand better what is good. In fact, good and beauty are intertwined. The same interior predisposition to enjoy beauty is required to discover the good. Through beauty, it is possible to enjoy the goodness of the good. Goodness of the, good. the joyful experience of receiving the good empowers us to give the best of ourselves, even if it is not reciprocated, even to anyone. We will behave in this way only if we acknowledge gratefully all the good we have received unconditionally. So we do not give in order to receive, but we give because we have received. These main ideas compound what Chesterton named the grammar of gratitude. 
If we learn this grammar, we will read in a more profound way our own reality. And what is more important, we will write better not only our own future story, but also the story of those who are close to us. We will contribute to write better for them. In addition of the instrumental reason and the moral reason, we should cultivate also the grateful reason. The character who states that beauty will save the world has an unusual ability. He knows the interior of the people better than themselves. This capacity leads him to sincere compassion for the suffering of the others, even to the point of self-sacrifice. The paradox Dostoevsky underlines is that this character <coughs> is considered as an idiot in the novel. In MBA schools, managers get an exhaustive formation in order to be more efficient. But if we consider organizations as groups of singular and unique persons who are able to give disinterestedly, maybe what organizations most need is that managers become a little more idiotic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh. So, first of all, I would like to thank you to everyone for being here with us. Of course, to the fantastic speakers we have today for their generosity of sharing their deep thoughts with us, their talent and expertise. And of course, also for the audience that I hope now the colloquium will be very active. I would like just to say thank you on behalf of my colleague and friend, the director of, of the RCC, Professor Martinez Sierra, he is actually in Spain. I'm just replacing him just for today, for this special moment. But uh, I hope that uh, he's back soon and we will just uh, actually uh, try to, to, <coughs> to replace this because I know, I know him very well and I think that he's missing this a lot. Uh, I would like just to set just a question to uh, uh, to Manolo. <laughs> when I, I was just uh, looking at the at the table, the two D table, I I miss a three dimension, a third dimension, uh, coming out the screen, that the, the developing more more. I mean, developing the, the the social being, the humans as social beings. How are those? I mean, columns and pillars uh, related? Because I think there is a lot of a lot of to say in this part of the screen. And thank you, and I hope we, we can steal more than one hour. Well, thank you very much, Jose Manuel. <laughs> I only had 10 minutes to talk about this, so I did. Uh, so you're right, he's an engineer, also an in, a telecommunication engineer, <laughs> and he was telling me, you're missing like the social thing and volume here, and I totally agree, and also the spiritual thing goes to the volume and the high thing. So yeah, we have to think a lot about that because it's moving from the personal level to the social one. We open that door when we say giving and when we say the other. Yeah. But then we need to think, how do you apply this to business and to organizations? And there's a lot of people here working on this, they may tell us. So a lot of work to be done, but I just wanted to open the door to all these dimensions, to my students and in general, to think about them because it's reasonable. It's not just reason. The three levels there, moral, person and useful, those three levels are the economic, sociology, psychology, and ethics, but the last one is reasonable, is faith. So you may have people who believe in God, people who do not believe in God, people who, are, who believe in a spiritual life, but that's reasonable. So we should talk about that to our students, because that's part of the entire human fulfilling. Right. So, but the volume and social one requests another paper. So I'm more than glad to write the paper with you. Another conference. Another conference. I want to thank you for inviting me. This has been an amazing conference. It's so important, as has been alluded by our panelists. To by our panelists, we are desperately in need, as a species, of figuring out what the ethical and spiritual motivations will be to get us through this century, uh, through the 21st century, through the next decade. So this is crucial. Our survival depends upon it. And what I'd like to ask builds on what Manuel just asked, Manuel, um, which is 
thinking about the, uh, the motivation that you call glory, or maybe there's something that we can call transcendence, or as Donna alluded to, transcendent joy. Uh, in the work that I do internationally, negotiation, trying to uh, work with parties who have killed each other, who've been in mortal conflict, trying to negotiate to bring them back together, to have hope for the future, to think about how they can get beyond the dignity violations, the, uh, the huge violations, to have some hope for the future, we've discovered that moving beyond narrow self-interest and connecting to our greater humanity, our connected uh, interdependence, can lead to negotiating for the greater good and coming out with value gained on both sides, what we call mutual gains on both sides. And one of the biggest gains is the connection, the, the human connection, and the connecting not only to this generation, but connecting to future generations, connecting to the hope for the future. So I just want to put that out to our panelists and also thank you for this incredibly important uh, conference. Uh, the question is sort of to the panel, but to Donna especially. When I think of uh, some of the great horrors or wrongs in the world, over time, even today, you're going back to the world wars. One of the things that seems to happen is you first view your enemy as not human, and then there's no reason to give them dignity. And I wonder how much you think or have found that this underlies someone. And then if that's the case, how do you give humanity back to the enemy if you're trying to negotiate things back? Okay, so uh, absolutely, I think the dehumanization that happens in international conflicts, I see it every single time I do an intervention, no matter where it is in the world. You have to dehumanize your enemy on, before you can kill them or treat them as if they're invisible or they don't matter. So, you know, I've had a really interesting experience with what it takes to rehumanize because many of us in the conflict resolution world, we try to bring the parties together, we have dialogues, we try to get them to empathize with the other side, but I'm telling you there's something in that conflict dynamic that is so hard to break. It's just almost impossible. So my new uh, approach, I have a whole new methodology that I use now, which is if I've got two parties in conflict, I've tried this now with three groups, with Turks and Greeks, with Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, with uh, Turks and Armenians. So I've tried it with these, with these three groups, and it's, ha and it's worked a, like a charm. And what I do is I say, okay, you all are not, we're not going to talk about the conflict when we get together here. I'm going to enlist all of you to become dignity leaders in your community. All right? No talking about the conflict. So what do I do? I put them in a room for two or three days, depending on how much time we have, and I, I, I share with them all of my research about dignity. So they learn about you know, the, the elements of dignity that I said, they, they learn about how important it is to all of us, and I've got just, in my book is filled with things, with lessons to learn about dignity. And by the time they're finished with that three-day workshop where they're students of dignity, not Israelis, not Palestinians, not Turks and Greeks, but they're sitting there learning how to lead with dignity. By the time they finish that three-day workshop, they cannot look at the other in the same way again. They just can't do it because they learn about human vulnerability. They learn about the way we react, that we all react in the same way. And basically what I'm asking them to do is to, to go to this transcendent identity to look at it, well, Paula left already, but to look at ourselves as members of the human species and that transcendent identity where we're all yearning for the same thing. And so that's how I do it now. And I'm telling you, it works like a charm. You cannot, once you learn this stuff, once it's inside you, 
you cannot dehumanize anymore. It's just, it was a miracle, actually. I didn't think about this to do this. It just happened because of some other circumstances. I stumbled upon this new methodology. But that's what I do, and it restores that primal empathy that we all have. All human beings have primal empathy. We all want to be connected to one another. It's these dignity violations that get in the way of our ability to connect with one another. Uh, and I'm, I would like to thank you for inviting me. Um, I think that all the things that you have said help us uh, to be better persons, parents, teachers, um, and also in our research. Um, and the wisdom of all the things is how we can apply the things to real um, research or in our teaching, I think. And something that I was, um, yesterday I was in New Hampshire, this state, I'm working on the death penalty and the dignity of the, the people that they have been uh, wrongly com convicted to death penalty and they have been for years and years in death row and then someone uh, have found that they, they, they were innocent. So um, the key question is, okay, if the death penalty is violating our dignity and if we can get rid of the death, the death penalty, which are other alternatives? So some people have been discussing about uh, restorative justice, for example. And my question is maybe to, to Donna, if you have any experience uh, of uh, this issue of, of restorative justice as a way of bringing back uh, dignity in, in any conflict. <coughs> Thank you. I, I think that uh, restorative, the restorative justice paradigm is a real viable alternative to what we're seeing in our prisons now. And I mean, for those of you who don't know, it's a way of, they emphasize restoring the relationship rather than a punitive approach, and they bring the whole communities together to try to bring the, both the victim and the perpetrator into dialogue around what the consequences were and, and all of that. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I honestly, Alejandro, I think that we need to, to have a public debate about what these alternatives are. I mean, I think restorative justice is one, but I think we need, as, as much as we need to understand climate change, we need to understand alternatives to our prison system. We had a big conversation about this earlier. So I think maybe, maybe it's time for us to open up that debate, because yeah. I do think restorative justice will, will be, is one. Uh, I, I just don't think every human, everybody, every politician is going to sign on to that. Yeah. So I think we need to think more creatively about that. First of all, thank you. It's been such an inspiring morning. And I was, I, I have a corporate background before I ended up leaving it for many of the reasons that Donna pointed out. So my question to you is, do you think there is hope in the corporate world for restoring dignity? I have to say that based on my experience, I would doubt it, but maybe you can give me <laughs> hope. <laughs> and why do you think, if it, if it is possible, why, why, why can we hope for, for changing that kind of relationship? Well, I do. I am hopeful. And, um, you know, you've got to keep in mind, I've been working on international conflicts where people have been killing each other left and right and center. And so I do believe if we can make some movement in those conflicts, I certainly think we can do something in the corporate world. Because again, I don't think we're dealing with bad people. Honestly, I think we, we're dealing with people who have gone astray in some ways, uh, ethically and morally astray. But I think, um, I guess I, I've worked too long with Archbishop Tutu to, um, to abandon hope in people. I mean, he thinks we're all good no matter what, right? So um, I happen to agree with that. And I think my experience in the corporate world is that the people who make these decisions that are uh, affect negatively um, their employees, they're just not aware. They're just not aware. And for those of, those of them who are aware, they're more worried about what the rest of the leadership community is going to think, not so much what the employees are about, but they have to break that entire corporate senior VP culture. And that is, that is a real problem. That is a problem. But they want to. They absolutely, fundamentally want to. It's just going to take some time. Would you not agree that a lot of it is systemic? Yes. In other words, in how corporations develop their policies and procedures and strategies, that can de be very dehumanizing, as you pointed out in your comments. 
So one, one place to begin would be to try to change that systemic dehumanization. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that's in part what the, uh, the business ethics movement has been trying to do in consulting with corporations and trying to set up uh, a more humanizing uh, mm -hmm. strategy. Uh, a long way to go, of course. I think um, the current system has promoted a lot of sociopaths, <laughs> uh, serious, serious, serious sociopaths to the head of many of our institutions. And so that's seriously problematic because they do not have the capacity for empathy. Um, I think one of the things we need to do is change the purpose of, as we, we think about the purpose of the corporation, um, there is a movement to do this, um, <coughs> not moving very fast, but... Um, too many people believe that the purpose of the corporation is to maximize shareholder wealth, which really, there's no, as Lynn Stout would be the first to tell you, there's no law that says that you have to maximize shareholder wealth. Um, but there is hope, I think, because what we're seeing is a bubbling up from sort of underneath of new types of enterprises, multi-purpose uh, multi, um, enterprises, lots of social entrepreneurship, the, the rising dominance of B corporations. 37 states now have um, laws on the books that explicitly allow companies to pay attention to stakeholders. So, um, you know, but we need a, a generation of leaders with the courage to step outside the current norms. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of words. Uh, I would say trust is the synonym of, of hope. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Trusting means you, tr you hope that this person, so trusting others, trusting yourself, trusting you are able to, do, to give to the others. And if you believe in God, trusting him, because it's not just we are alone, but we are children of God, if you believe in God. But the thing, the general thing is about trust. And we are here because we trust we can do something. And I guess that writing papers, Discussing this is helping new generations of just in, including these aspects in their training, which for me that's hope. I mean, I hope in human nature and in, in intellect, the truth of the good and the beauty of the good. We were talking about that. Mm -hmm. I believe in that and I trust in that. So I guess that's the future. So you shouldn't, I mean, you should go to the business world. <laughs> <So go back. laughs> I'm, I'm a lawyer, a recovering lawyer, actually. And, and language is important. Words are important to me. And, and I, I very much like your concept of, of dignity. I'm trying to square that with what we developed as the second pillar of the guiding principles, which was the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, which means not to infringe on human rights, which means recognizing that everybody is entitled to, uh, uh, to enjoy internationally recognized human rights. And I'm just trying to figure out where dignity fits in there. I've used it a lot as, a, as almost synonymous with respect. But then you, you said, well, you have to earn respect. And that sounds right to me. But I'm just trying to square the, square the two so that I can help use it. It's a very powerful the word. Dignity is a very powerful word when you're in the workplace and you are trying to introduce the concept of, of human rights when you're telling a worker um, that, look, we respect you. We value your dignity, and that makes a worker want to, you know, watch out for the back of the other worker and, and make sure that they don't, you know, step into an open manhole or do something, do something unsafe. But can you help? Can you help? Yeah, help me help. with those two concepts. I can because yes. I had to grapple with that myself. I, I started out. <laughs> Uh, when I first started in this business, I uh, was a human rights uh, educator, and I had spent some time in Cambodia right after the Pol Pot uh, left, and it was during the UNTAC, uh, United Nations uh, Transitional Authority in Cambodia. And so I was doing human rights education with Khmer women. And it was at that time, you know, I knew all about the Universal Declaration and about CEDAW and all the conventions. I mean, I, I had to because I was teaching all of this stuff. And I was um, mindful that the stories that we heard from the Khmer women about ways in which they had felt violated 
Yes, many of them had to do with they didn't have access to health care. They didn't have access to <coughs> education and all those things that are what I you know, think are the most profound, those 30 principles of uh, the Universal Declaration. But because I was a psychologist and trained to think in terms of way, the ways people could be injured psychologically, you know, there, there's no denial of their legal rights, but I can, I can mistreat you by shaming you, by dismissing you, by treating you rudely, by not honoring your identity, by discriminating against you. So there were all these psychological ways in which people were experiencing violations to their dignity. And I thought, you know, the Universal Declaration is great for these objective measures, but what about the way we feel on a daily basis when people injure us in those psychological ways that I was talking about, injuries to our dignity. So, I mean, not to be too grandiose about this, but I see the elements of dignity that I've proposed, and other people have proposed other things as well, but I see them as the psychological correlates of the, the guiding principles in the Universal Declaration. So that's how I, I managed to wed those two things together, because I think the human rights is the legal framing of this, but I think the psychological framing is equally as devastating to people. And in fact, some people you know, commit suicide because they've been so psychologically wounded. So it's not like this isn't, doesn't have effects on, uh, profound effects on how people experience um, the world. So that's how I did it. I got really interested in these issues about a dozen years ago. And the really, really difficult part for a CEO, if you really believe in this, is to stop looking at your employees as sort of elements of a spreadsheet, as some things that help you to achieve an economic return, and begin to look at them as someone, as people whose dignity really is going to be enhanced by the work that they're doing within your corporation. Uh, that is a really tough transition. You know, I was educated here at Harvard, and they never told me anything like that. And to get your head moved from the spreadsheet to the person is very, very difficult. Um, listening to Donna was fascinating because the, I had a sense that really taking leaders, business leaders, and helping them to grow in human virtues that were really critically important to the dignity of their employees was, was the right thing to do. And she listed the 10 human virtues probably that are the most important really to help business leaders to, um, to acquire so that they, in fact, can treat their employees in a more dignified way. Having done one of these things sort of roughly, uh, all, all I can tell you is that the beauty of it is that the economic returns are phenomenal. When you treat people well and you help them to become better employees, the numbers take care of themselves. So you don't have to make this trade-off that business people are afraid of all the time. If, if I do the right thing, it's going to really hurt my company. That's not the case. So uh, anyway, I'm very grateful to you, Donna, for kind of articulating that, and I think it'll be fun to sort of take those 10 propositions and maybe think a little bit more about which virtues are these, really, that business leaders need to acquire. I want to raise two issues <coughs> because uh, a lot of wonderful uh, uh, thoughts have been uh, placed before us. Um, and the one has to do, and what I got from all four of you is number one, that you are, we are all want to challenge the status quo as things are. We find them dysfunctional. We find that they are too competitive. They are win and lose, you know? And also, they are very hierarchical. And for me, hierarchy, I always connect it to patriarchy, you know? And I always connect it to the literature that I learned from feminist theories and also uh, feminist movements, uh, how we really need to get away from how our Western world of thinking has, um, in a way, not only trained us, but wired us, you know, to think in those ways. So I was thinking yesterday, you know, I drove with Donna and on the way back, she said there will be a lot of traffic in Watertown near the cemetery. I asked why. She said two firemen, you know, were killed while saving other people's lives. And I thought, my God, we have this capacity to sacrifice our lives for the others unconditionally, right? They could have run away. They could have done other things to save themselves first. But on the other hand, I also thought 
that, look, we have the capacity to kill our next door neighbor, you know, to dehumanize, to view him or her as a threat, as a, you know, fearful person and so on. So my question is, how do we build these um, <coughs> structures and this culture in organizations, since we are talking about organizations here, that will introduce what Sandra said about the, the issue, this concept of wisdom, which for me, thank you, Sandra, it opened up a lot of uh, new thinking in my work as well, and bring in this holistic you know, view, this holistic understanding, without really making the other feel that, oh, this is some soft stuff here. You know, we are out here in a very hard and cruel world, and we've got to stick to other things that, right now. So one is that. And the other, I liked very much, you know, this concept of moral imagination. You know, and if you can say a little bit more about this, because I believe we are in need of a new imaginary for the whole of our globe and in so many ways and so on. And then uh, for Thomas, you know, this um, uh, value of beauty, let's talk a little bit more about it, how we can make it part of our daily living and in our corporations. Thank you. Um, well, to, the, to the idea of moral imagination, um, uh, Russell Ackoff, who was a management scholar, talked about wisdom. He defined wisdom, in fact, as the ability to think through the consequences of our actions. And that's really what moral imagination is. Um, Pat Warhain, who really has developed the concept, has uh, talked, has linked it to systems understanding, what I call systems understanding. Um, she calls, talks about systems thinking. So it's this, it is this holistic capacity. I don't think in our, much of our education we're, we're educating people to think systemically. We're really educating them kind of in uh, functions or line very linearly, especially in Western traditions. Um, someone mentioned that earlier. Um, and so uh, we, we really need to begin to think more integratively across disciplines to provide in classrooms ed education for our students in ways that help them to develop their systems understanding. Because I think these other things come along with it. My belief is that most people want to be good, yeah. are good. I mean, so um, I think we've got a system that promotes a lot of sociopaths. But, um, but I think most people actually are good in our organizations and want to do the right thing. But they don't see, they don't have that moral imagination. Um, my former colleague, Jim Waters, talked about um, uh, moral muteness. So moral muteness. We don't raise moral issues in our, um, too often in our organizations. And it's hard to do that. I think Donna spoke to that when she spoke about some of the dignity issues earlier. Um, so how do we create new types of institutions where these, um, these capacities are raised? And I think what we're seeing, I, I, another book I wrote is called Sea Change, Change to a Sustainable Enterprise uh, uh, economy and what what we're seeing with a lot of these newer organizations is that they're founded with different values mm -hmm. and they are founded with multiple bottom line orientations and they're founded with their stakeholders in mind and there are some ways of getting people to to think about that but we have a lot of sort of re-education of people to do and, you, and it has to start early but it also has to um, Bob Eccles and um, George Serafin at the Harvard Business School talk about, you know, one way of effecting system change, which I'm interested in these days, is to think about getting to the, the 1,000 CEOs of the largest corporations and the 20 um, uh, leaders of the largest nations in the world, you know, and changing their mindsets. Well, great, but, you know, I mean, yes, lovely if we could do it, and I think we ought to try. Um, and try, by exposing them to new, new things and really getting them to think outside of their own <coughs> current boxes, that's one way of doing it. But there's also this bottom-up thing that has to happen. So it's both top-down and bottom-up, I think, um, that needs to happen. 
Mm, well, uh, thank you for the question, Maria. Um, that's a very um, hard and interesting topic. So how can we get to beauty? Uh, in classical Greeks uh, knew that the door to the wisdom was amazement. So uh, I think this is a, a very interesting point in the education. Uh, we have to try to uh, teach people to get amazed. In fact, Chesterton uh, has a, um, a, I think that's a very important uh, article. Uh, he was talking about the danger of our culture, and I think it was in 1927. And at that time, there was the, between the two world war, and he said that the, the danger of our culture is the increasingly vulgarity. Mm. So, uh, the increasingly uh, vul vulgarity. Vulgar well, vulgarity. Vulgarity. So, uh, and that was in the 1927, so uh, <laughs> you, can, you can imagine. So, uh, I think people have a, a I mean, a, we are calling to beauty. So, when we do not have the encounter of beauty, we try to uh, get that beauty with anything. But that's a false beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you you are closing the doors to to a train of transcendence and to joyful experience. So most of the times we are uh, conf uh, confusing uh, beauty with entertainment. Mm -hmm. oh, and well, you have asked before that uh, how can it can be applied to organizations. Well, I have just two um, two ideas, two, su two suggestions. First of all, is the weekend. I remember a book written by Piper. Uh, he was uh, explaining that the the weekend uh, has a value in itself. However, in in our culture, that the work is so important, the weekend is uh, understood as a way of uh, getting uh, new forces for continue working. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, uh, Greeks mainly, but uh, and also the G uh, mainly the Jew uh, culture, uh, make that the, the Sunday or the Sabbath has value in itself. Mm -hmm. To doing things that are not useful, to be with friends, to be with family, to read, to uh, to enjoy. That would mm -hmm. be the the. The point that's not to be um, in party after party, or no, no, you have to read and to to have conversations that the the daily day is is very difficult. I think that's very important to understand better uh, the work we are doing every day. And the second point about the organizations is that um, connecting to the logic of giving, um, mm, we want to have the predictable uh, things. Uh, so that's science has uh, taught us that uh, we have to predict, and that's very useful. With we are working with incentives, or with the hierarchical uh, roles and functions. But in the this, in the when you are giving without an expectation of return, you you need hope. That Vanessa has pointed out. Uh, what kind of hope? Uh, the hope that you have the ability to give to the other, and that other one, when it, he receives or she receives unconditionally, he or she can give in the same way. But uh, it may not respond, so you have to take a risk. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's very difficult to take this kind of risks. Uh, and, but that's very important for I, in my sense because we are not machines. So if we have a spiritual dimension, we, that's creativity and that's the freedom to say no, to say yes. Uh, and that's, you, you need it in the logic of giving that you, uh, you know that you may not be responded. Mm -hmm. But you have to take that risk, otherwise there will be not the encounter of these, those such a joyful giving and receiving. Uh, William, can, can I just say one tiny thing to follow up on something important that um, that I think Sandra said that 
<clears throat> you know, the other thing about working with the executives um, and introducing <clears throat> these new ideas, and you said we need an education, and we need to take an educational approach. What I find is when I say the, the people who are in these leadership positions are not bad people, because they're not, they just don't know how to do this other stuff. Right? It's not about, because they have the brilliant technical knowledge. They're so skilled, and, and the, the structures actually reward this technical knowledge. But the, the reality is, when you're dealing with human beings, you need to know about this other stuff. You need to know how about what it means to be a human being, and all our vulnerabilities, and what makes us feel good, and what makes us. So that dignity knowledge, as I call it, of course, is something that they just haven't been trained to do. They just, and so the question is, how do you get over the shame of not knowing how to do what you don't know what to do? So, so for Manuel, uh, uh, I, thinking about the CSR community, for many, many years, a lot of us in business ethics and CSR fight against those who want to put CSR in a tiny box of philanthropy. It's simply giving money you know, to the ballet or something like that, and they're unable to open their minds up to so much more. So hearing your presentation and Tomas's presentation, it, in those 10 minutes each, it seems so crystal clear to those of us in this room that it's the right path to move down. Have you had any success, I guess both Manuel and Tomas, in making your points to a business audience who, like Donna and Sandra, we have lived in a world where we have to fight the temptation that they think about philanthropy instead of the responsible organization. What success or what has ever worked for you before in making your points to that audience? Well, that, that's a real question. <laughs> well, since the Institute this year when start, started, we've been having discussions with a lot of business people, and now we are in the process of training these people. And But, I mean, we just published this paper. Mm -hmm. And all these ideas just came here. So going back to, this, to the previous question, I guess we need to create the language and the culture. Um, we didn't have the language. For example, the concept of, well, dignity, I mean, all this new concept of moral uh, imagination, we need to have those concepts to start talking, because we don't have that before. Uh, so corporate social responsibility, most people just saying, well, this is an addition. This is something added. So we, I, I, we really want to say is that it's really a dimension, a human dimension of the corporation, and it's there. We have to switch on the light and tell them, well, this is part of the reality. You don't have the language, you don't have the knowledge, you don't have, well, let's try to build this together. So we already had experience with business people, they really believe in this, but I guess that probably in the application of this, you have examples here like Bill, he was talking, and I guess he had a lot of business experience. I guess that we need to have that experience more and more. We started in the world of education, training managers of schools in Spain. Mm -hmm. And they really love this. Because mm -hmm. we believe that we have to start by giving training to managers that are managing schools. Yeah. In Spain, the problem is not about resources in education, but managing resources. Yeah. They don't know. So we are adding all these dimensions that they are familiar with, because this is a calling vocation, a calling for them. They are just teachers. They want to know how to run the business. They don't know. They have no training. So we started this new program for teachers to learn how to be good managers, but including adding all this new language. Yeah. So I guess that's one step. We need to go to the world of business and start bringing the language. I guess it's a long process. I, I totally agree. Um, I, I want to connect the ignorance of some people that they don't know, but at the same time, there are many uh, universities trying to apply these things and many companies that they are leaving these things. So it's not that no company is doing this. There are many companies that they are doing this. So it's, it's like the combination of the two things, waking up the people that they have the ignorance, but they have the, the, the motivation, and the people that they are doing these things, knowing that these are uh, what you are doing has these um, concepts that we are trying to use for more, more communication. So I think there is a lot of hope here. Thank you very much, Manuel, for your framework. My question to all of you is, um, from your perspective, why is it so hard to actually talk about these things? Mm -hmm. To talk about worship, or spirit, or beauty, or shaman, 
and just really, um, just the language, it's, we almost get a little squeamish and embarrassed. So just, I was just interested in your reflections. Um, yeah, thanks, Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Madeline for years. Um, when I started to write, I've been afraid of this book for years. I've been wanting to write it. I did the interviews a couple of years ago, and I've been afraid of it for exactly the reasons that you name. It feels like coming out, in a way. Um, I am a lapsed Catholic, um, even though I teach at Boston College. Um, and, you know, religion, formal religion to me is, you know, I don't want to go near it for a lot of reasons. And yet, there is this spiritual practice associated with becoming, trying to learn about shamanism. And so, um, and I would say, you know, not all of the people I interviewed for this book are overtly religious, but they do have this bigger sense of purpose. Now, why it's so hard to talk about it um, is, I think it's got to do with this notion of moral muteness, that we find it hard to raise these issues in our organizations because it's soft, it's off topic, it's, um, as a dean I know would say, not business central. You know, and so therefore unimportant. Not quantifiable. Not quantifiable. Yeah. yeah, may I say just a word? I mean, I, it's totally connected with that. It's about the scientific world. Mm -hmm. This is not science. And in fact, Maslow in his last book, he's saying, well, probably you believe that this is not science, but it's my entire experience as a human being dealing with people that these motivations are there. And he's just saying this is real. This is a fact. It's not just values. It's a, real, a reality. And we have to check that with, I mean, trying to measure something and also to agree that there are things that cannot be measured, as Thomas was saying. Uh, but we need the language. And colloquies like this one, in which we want openly say whatever. Uh, I am a practicing Catholic, and I guess that I'm not damaging anyone by saying that God is my father. And if you open the door to that possibility, it's not bringing any damage to anyone, but just saying, okay, there is another spectator here who wants everything to be better, more beauty, um, like the truth, of everything. So opening the door to the reality of spirituality, religion, and so on is not bringing any damage. It's like we believe that if we bring that, we will start fighting. It is not true. This is part of human life, human nature. So why don't sh we are intellectuals. And the problem with intellectuals today is that it's like if you're talking about this, you're not a good intellectual. It's not part of the ranking of the top A journals. Mm -hmm. So I guess we had to escape from there. Thing out of the box. We do. You were talking about education. You are talking about the need to bring these things to the schools to educate the future leaders. And as a <clears throat> excuse me, retired physician and teacher in a medical school, I'm reminded of the whole thing over the last 30 years where everybody complained about the behavior of physicians and the need to acculturate students to a better way of thinking, empathy, and other things. And the realization, at least for me, there's nothing like a good residency to destroy an education in medical school. And so to think only of the training of the students without thinking about the social culture into which they shall enter, which won't accept much of this at all and not address it there, while things will change, it will be many more generations than if there were some way to also get to the businesses to get to the leaders and simultaneously teach the new generation and change the existing generation. Yeah, I, I'm going to pick up on Mike's point about systemic change. I think you're absolutely right. Um, until we change the purpose of the corporation, until we uh, create nudges that, that change the system, um, that we're not going to change leaders. Leaders are only responding to the incentives that they are, are Seeing, just like we academics are responding to impact factors or whatever, um, w um, leaders are responding to the, what they perceive that Wall Street wants them to do. So we have to change the culture. But we have a huge. There's. I think we're heading off an ecological cliff. Um, the IPCC report was just released a couple days ago, and you know the situation for humanity isn't great. Now, hum humans respond pretty well to uh, crisis situations but not so well to slowly evolving situations. And it may be that we're going to face a crisis that will force us to rethink our system in ways that will bring more humanity into our organizations. Boy, you know, I hope it doesn't take a, a, a crisis, a calamity of some sort, but um, 
somehow to develop that awareness in, in people and, and also to effect some system change through changing the purpose of the corporation, through uh, regulations that require certain things of businesses. By taming Wall Street, we have an outrageously powerful Wall Street you know, financial system now, which we didn't have 40 years ago. We got it now, and it's created all kinds of havoc. Do you want to say something? Uh, in the point of this uh, way to change, uh, in the logic of giving, uh, we have uh, identified a uh, a point that is uh, very interesting to start a change, because you can find people that they are they are not going to give unconditionally. But if you find someone that is giving conditionally, uh, it makes possible to other to discover the good and to change, and to change uh, and to give in the same way. Before I mentioned the possibility of that, uh, that giving is rewarded with nothing. But if it is rewarded, then it can move the other to give in the same way. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, McIntyre has pointed out very well that uh, uh, we grow in a play of uncalculated giving and in a grateful receiving in, in order to become a, an independent human being. But in the beginning, we are dependent, eh? the baby infant that Donna mentioned before. And I think this is very important in, in professions or jobs that are related with uh, people directly, as healthcare or teachers. Um, so uh, I mean, I think the way is uh, if we try to explain better this behavior, this uh, dynamic that is uh, not predictable, maybe it, it is not scientific, but it's real and spiritual, then we can move others. So the problem is that if we are explaining human behavior as self-interested only, uh, we are trapped. Uh, and that's very important, not only in those kind of jobs, but uh, in, business man, in business you are working with people. Well, Sorry, sorry. I, I, I have to tell this story because it's one of my favorite stories. And, Leon, and Leon's going to love it because I have to tell you that I'm doing an intervention at Mount Auburn Hospital. They, I, I spoke to the board. This was about a year ago. They decided they wanted to establish a culture of dignity in their, their hospital. And so I'm doing dignity leadership training. We've uh, identified, I think, about 24 people from all different levels of the hierarchy, Maria. There's the doctors, there are the nurses, there are the technicians, there are the, sec uh, the staff assistants, there are the, um, the guy who is in charge of cleaning, right? Um, everybody who has a position of, you know, some kind of a, a potential to influence people, that we are working together and I'm doing trainings with them dignity leadership training so that when they go back into their jobs, they're going to be the go-to dignity person. We call them dignity agents, right, in the, in the organization. And I just, I am so happy about this, you know, because this is, not only did the board walk the talk, but they are taking this so t seriously and establishing this, this you know, system-wide culture of dignity. And it, oh, oh, and so the most important thing is that there's a cross-section of everybody. There's no hierarchy. Maria's hierarchy that she's so concerned about. This is everybody is equal in dignity on this leadership team. Nobody has any pow power over anybody else. Mm. So it's so exciting. Uh, very happy to be here today. And we're very interested in how multimedia um, broadcasting and journalism actually has a, a voice within this. And um, we'd actually like to launch a, a show on our own network uh, that continues this discussion in a much more public forum. Um, but getting into this, uh, number one, Donna, I'm very fascinated by the idea of dignity. Um, specifically, not only dignity of the individual, but of work itself and the organization itself. And can we have a dialogue about businesses themselves having their own inherent dignity mm -hmm. and that practice? Mm -hmm. Going beyond that, getting into uh, Gift, Thomas, speaking there of um, how uh, a business, is my business model or organization set up to actually, um, that beautiful thing that you said, uh, we, I, I give because I have received kind of thing. Is a business doing that? And I think we can all agree that what happened in the financial crisis was the opposite of that. Um, so is my business set up to do that? And then getting back to, um, to dignity as a whole within the organization, speaking of the uh, 
um, the sort of uh, schizophrenia we might have, that what's happening where we're not actually addressing the, the whole dignity of the human person in the business world, are we actually, in fact, harming the dignity of the business itself? Yes. And then the individual. Well, so yes. uh, there's kind of three different things. A couple of times during the course of the commentary, uh, Tomas and Manuel in particular used the term beauty, as did um, Chris, right? Mm -hmm. Chris. Um, and it just struck me, I uh, had something of an, of an epiphany. Many, many years ago, um, I, in school, had um, the opportunity to learn about the oath of the Athenian city. And if you substitute the word corporation for city, uh, that oath is we will transmit this city, not only not less, but greater, better, and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. And I think that that is something of a recurring theme uh, within each of your respective comments. So mm. it took until the end of the session for that to, to dawn on me, but I'm glad it happened. That's great. Yeah, going, thank you very much for this comment. It's really great, the one that you did. And Chris, I wanted to go back to the idea of the dignity of work. Uh, I guess it's connecting everything we said, and it's not only about the person, but the, the activity of human beings. And we are here working for eight hours every single day, except the Saturday or the Sunday, we stop for relax and enjoy and pray. So the thing is that this dignity of work, uh, you need that. Because if you go to work every single day, and you go to work and you never talk about the other things that you have in mind during the rest of the day in your family, in your, then it's, this is schizophrenia means that you, you are not living a unity of life. I mean, if I try to do good things during the day, why shouldn't I do that in my business work? So it's yeah. just about a unity of life. It's about a psychological healthiness. Yeah. So we should go, I guess that could be a very nice topic for next year colloquium, okay. talking about <laughs> healthy organizations or the work itself, the dignity of work itself. I don't mm -hmm. know, but this is flourishing. This is creating, cultivating, cultivation of the environment in organization and the work to be people able to flourish as human being in every dimension. Yeah, so I love that idea. Thank you very much for bringing that idea. Could be next time. What a gift, huh? Yeah, it was a gift. Given without, without expecting Without expecting it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, I think it's only appropriate that our last question this year come from last year's colloquium chairman. Uh, so, Mike, Mike Hoffman, you have the floor. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, Mike Hoffman from uh, the Center for Business Ethics at Bentley University. And this is a good follow-up question, I think. Uh, to Jack's point in talking about beauty, because I wanted, um, I was very intrigued by Sandra's, um, uh, what she called aesthetic sensitivity. Sensibility. Sensibility. And, I, and, and it struck me that when Tomas was talking about sort of this receiving or experience of beauty, that there's a connection between uh, the, this aesthetic sensibility, uh, sensitivity, and this experience of beauty, which is, was important both to your concept of giving uh, and to, to your concept of wisdom. I wonder if the two of you could have just a quick connection, dialogue, and see how they work together. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I talk about aesthetic sensibility. There's two aspects to it. One is sort of the appreciation of beauty. So, so it's the beautiful and the good, the true, and the beautiful, right? And um, it's the appreciation of beauty or the design elements in the system or, or the theory or whatever we're looking at. But there's also, for many of the people that I studied, they are artists in one way or another. And so there is this creativity the piece of it as well. And it's in the giving of their art to the world or to themselves or to their family or whatever they're doing it for um, that um, that that element of the beauty. Not, uh, not all of them are actually artists, but many of them are. Ed Freeman is a musician and a songwriter. And a remark made by Jim uh, has reminded me the the Plato Smith of the uh, prisoner in the cavern. The what? The prisoner in the cavern. The cave, oh, sorry, the cave, the cave. <laughs> sorry, in the cave. <laughs> and, and I think that it could be connected also with uh, your question, Mike. Uh, so what Plato explains is that uh, when the prisoner came out and he uh, goes to the outer, to the shining day, as today, uh, he's, uh, mm, well, 
he knows in that moment that uh, the world he knew in the cave was uh, was not real. So, uh, so, so that's shadows. That's right. So, but Plato uh, underlines that you need the sun and you need the light because the light let, uh, lets you to uh, see the same things in another way. So if we take into account that uh, in Greek, uh, so Plato is talking about the sun as the good. However, in, in the Greek language, the good and the beauty is the same word. Really? Yeah. So that explains how it changed the, the way. Plato uh, uh, is underlining that uh, the prisoner has to go back to the, to the cave and he knows that he probably will not be understood. But he has uh, the joy to go back. In fact, the, the question uh, that starts the Republic, uh, the Republic dialogue is not just about the, how we can organize the Republic. There is the question about justice. And Socrates is addressed in a very hard uh, question. So um, some of the people who are talking with Socrates uh, says that um, human being is unjust. Socrates says no. But there is the last objection is, well, in fact, uh, people want to appear as just, although you are really unjust. So that's the wall of appearance. But Socrates is, um, is uh, stating um, against all the, all the other people that no, no, justice has a value in itself because he has gone out to the, from the cave and he has seen all the reality in a new light. So that's the difference. At the end of the dialogue, he will, see, he will affirm that probably in this world we will not have justice. But, but if justice has value in, in itself, uh, so that's uh, we, it's worthwhile to work in it. In fact, what we owe to Plato in the Western civilization is the discovering of, of spiritual dimension. So that's what we owe to Plato. Uh, and that's, the, that's uh, uh, probably one of the main ideas uh, from the Greeks uh, and that different from other cultures uh, we have. Um, after Plato, we have to take into account this discovery. Fantastic. Well, this has been an extraordinarily rich discussion, ending in Socratic, dial uh, Socratic wisdom. <laughs> uh, I hope we'll, we'll continue a number of discussions over lunch, which is being served immediately, and all that remains is to join me in thanking our panelists today for a rich discussion.